Well, good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. Um, as you heard, I'm Steve Ansell. I work at Mayo Clinic, work along with Dr. Kyle, Dr. Gertz, and uh, a variety of other folks. And I um, wanted to take you through uh, a complicated topic, which I hope actually will be kind of simple and interesting to you, because I think Maury Gertz this morning did a great job of setting the stage with his analogy about the garden. And I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the 1% plasma cells or lymphoplasmacytic cells that he showed that is what you're supposed to have and how you can end up with them becoming weeds and the problem that they might, uh, might cause. So the presentation I've got has got two parts to it. The first part is how do B cells work? And the second part is how do they talk to each other? And how do they talk to other cells too? And uh, the reason that really matters is that firstly, as we understand the disease, we know how to better target the disease. And most importantly, as I'll show you, new targeted therapies that Dr. Trion will talk about, I'm sure, later today, are actually built on us understanding some of the biology of how these cells work. So the first thing I want to do is just explain to you, when you see a bacteria, when you breathe in a virus, when you go out in the garden and breathe in some foreign pollen, what does your immune system do? And what do B cells do? What's their job? What, how do they work? And that really matters because when we understand what a normal B cell does, we'll understand what a cancer B cell, or in this case, a Waldenstrom cell, or a lymphoplasmacytic cell does. And that'll help us understand how we might be able to get that cell to behave itself. And on top of that, what weed killer, as you heard earlier today, we might pick to allow us to actually have the cell die off. So what you're seeing over here in this little uh, cartoon of yellow cells here, this cell that you see right here is what's called a B lymphocyte. So lymphocytes are part of your immune system. Their job is to fight infection, and they come in two types. You get a T lymphocyte. I joke and tell people they're the hand-to-hand -hand combat kind of guys. And you get a B lymphocyte, and they're part of the artillery. They make proteins that can travel, can be kind of fired, if you like, to attack and kill off foreign proteins. And when they see a cell, or when they see a virus, or when they see a bacteria, or when they see some pollen, or something they don't care for, they get activated. And I'll explain to you in a minute about what happens when they get activated. But when they get activated, they change from the small lymphocyte into a bigger plasma cell. And when they make a, become a bigger plasma cell, that's the cell that makes the protein that are antibodies that Maury was talking about earlier. So here you can see the picture of a B cell becoming activated, becoming larger, becoming a plasma cell, and you can see these large protein molecules that you heard that uh, Jan Waldenstrom described, these monster power particles, if you like, which are IgM. This is what it looks like under a microscope. That cell that you see there, the small one with the dark center, that's the lymphocyte. This cell that you see that's bigger with its nucleus off toward the side and the kind of blue stuff inside of it, that's a plasma cell. And this blue stuff is actually the IgM that's present inside the tumor. And when you use really high techniques like electron microscopy, you can see those cells here. And you can see all this little stuff around here is where the IgM actually is. So there are two ways in which your immune system sees things it doesn't like and attacks them. And this matters a lot in Waldenstrom's because I'll, I'll tell you, we're targeting both of these ways as ways to actually treat patients. So the first thing I'm going to tell you about is called the B-cell receptor pathway. And you've all heard about a brutinib, and a brutinib targets that pathway. The second way that you're going to hear about is called the toll-like receptor pathway. And that's a separate way with mighty 88s in that pathway that's amplifying that pathway. So those are two really, and mighty 88 as you well are aware, is what is mutated or changed or, or genetically altered in patients with Waldenstrom's in 90 to 95% of the cases. So both of those pathways are really important, and both of those are places where targeted therapy, or if you like highly specific a weed killer, can actually be used. So the first thing is, if you get your flu shot, or if you actually run into the flu virus, and you breathe it in, your body sees that as abnormal. It binds to what's called the B-cell receptor. And you can see those on the outside of these little cells. That little particle there is binding to that B-cell receptor. It gets taken back to your lymph nodes and basically gets, gets shown to the immune system, a little bit like your cat who's out in the garden who catches something and proudly brings it back for you to have a look and see what it is. See what I found. And your immune system goes, that isn't good. I don't like that. 
And so what it does is it interacts and T cells and B cells, and I'll tell you in a minute why that matters. They talk to each other about exactly how bad this is. The B cell undergoes changes as it begins to make these antibodies. And what it does is it makes an antibody and it checks the fit. And it makes a second antibody and it checks the fit. If the fit is good, then the body tweaks it till it's making a better and a better and a better and a better and a better antibody. Generally, as I'll show you in a minute, those antibodies are IgG antibodies. They are highly specific. They dock on to just one kind of protein. That's the B cell receptor pathway. That monoclonal protein then, anti antibody directed against a bacteria, is sent back out in the bloodstream to take care of the flu virus. The second way is called the toll-like receptor. So I joke and say this is quick and dirty. This is just we need something and we need it right now. So you might know if you've ever had an infection, sometimes you were feeling perfectly fine when you woke up in the morning. Lunchtime you kind of felt a little off, but man, mid-afternoon you felt really grim. And it changed like that. The process I showed you with the B-cell receptor, it takes about a week for the body to do that. The problem is some of these things that are making you that sick, you don't have a week. If you take a week to work out how to take care of this infection, you could be horribly sick by that time. So that's where the Tollright receptor pathway comes in. It's the, we need it right off the shelf and we need it right now. And what, these, what this is, is that these plasma cells have made an antibody that will stick to a lot of things. And so it will be one of those kind of contain it, keep it under control while the more specialized antibodies are being made. So toll-like receptors basically see foreign DNA. Anytime they see a virus or a bacteria or something just has DNA that's not kind of like it, that immediately is like a red flag to a bull and these cells start making lots of protein. Interestingly, the protein these cells make in response to this toll-like receptor pathway is IgM. So that's what you need IgM for. You need it to be able to take care of things quickly, take care of a lot of things. So that's what makes an IgM molecule kind of sticky because it sticks to lots of things because it needs to be able to corral lots of infections. But that's why it sometimes sticks to your red cells, causes anemia. That's why it sometimes sticks to your, to your nerves, causes neuropathy because it's kind of sticky and sticks to lots of things. And as I'll show you in a moment, it's what's called a pentamer. It's got five parts to it. That's what makes it such a big molecule so that it can stick to lots of things. So just to say, what does a B cell do normally? It makes, and Maury was showing us these G, A, and M antibodies. Well, this is just sort of some cartoons to explain what they look like. So this is what an IgG molecule looks like. It's kind of like a pitchfork. It's got two parts. The front parts up here are what stick, the top part over here. And this at the back is what activates the immune system to grab onto it. One thing the immune system hates is cells with antibodies stuck on the outside of them. That's kind of, again, another red flag to the bull. And immediately, it'll take care of those cells. So why should you care? Well, if you have nerves with antibodies stuck on them, big cells called macrophages, the trash collectors of your immune system, they come and take big bites and kind of nibble off, if you like, this particular protein that's stuck on the, the antibody that's stuck on your nerves. And as Maury showed you, that's where your insulation suddenly gets holes. And when it gets holes, it starts to short circuit, and that's where the neuropathy comes from. This that you see here, the next one over, is the IgM. And you can see it's actually five of these all kind of linked together. That's what makes it such a big molecule. That's what makes it challenging because it actually ends up uh, in, the, in the circulation, making your circulation very thick and causing hyperviscosity. IgA is a little different. It's mainly in your uh, mucuses, mucous membranes, in your nose, in your gut. And IgG and IgE are kind of more related to uh, allergy and other issues. So in Waldenstrom, what went wrong? How come we've got all of this protein? How come we've got all these weeds that are making the protein? So you might remember the key thing is this lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate. So again, you can see these cells present in the bone marrow. You can see some of them that look a little smaller, like lymphocytes, hence the lympha part of the cytic cell. And the bigger cells, like plasma cells, hence the plasmacytic infiltrate. So these cells 
are cells that started off the small uh, monos, uh, small lymphocytes and are turning into plasma cells and they're kind of in the middle, in transition. They're on their way from being small and not activated to being large and super activated, hence lymphoplasmacytic. And as you know, they make this IgM. And I would just pick up a little bit on what Maury said. This is a little more complicated sometimes than one appreciates because not every cell makes the same amount of IgM. So it isn't a case of saying that if you have 10 IgM cells, you've got 10 amounts of protein. And if you have 100, you have 100 fold. Everyone is different. Some people, the, the cells are making just a little bit. Some people are making way more. Some cells are making just a little bit. Some are making way more. So exactly how to draw a straight line from the one to the other is very hard. And that's why for each patient, the IgM is important. But between patients, the IgM is really unimportant because it's difficult to draw the comparisons. And as I'll show you in a minute, what the immune system is hearing from its environment actually determines how much of the protein is being made. So the first problem in Waldenstrom's, as you already are aware, is this big IgM molecule. It's not IgG. That's what you get when you get myeloma, like we heard about last night. Uh, but these big proteins are unusual, stick to a lot of things, and their size is what causes significant problems. The second problem, as you heard this morning from Maury, was just the fact that you've got too many weeds in your garden, and these cells start to crowd out the other cells that are around. These cells have got a number of issues. One, they're growing too quickly. They're listening to the environment that's kind of giving them bad messages. They're in a bad neighborhood, if you like. And they also have these mutations or genetic changes inside of them that are driving them to grow faster. So what exactly makes the IgM go high in some, low in others, not really uh, secreted by some cells, secreted by others? And this is what our lab has done a lot of work trying to understand. What are the messages and the way in which the environment is talking to the cancer cell? So here are the cancer cells, these little blue ones that you can see kind of spread out throughout the bone marrow. And illustrated here are these cancer cells. But you can see that in the bone marrow are lots of other cells, the other 90% of what you're supposed to have there. And there are a variety of other cells, cells that make up blood vessels, cells that make up other immune cells. These cells all make various proteins called cytokines, which are kind of the messaging system in which these cells talk to each other and tell them how to work and tell them what to do. So exactly how do they do that is what I want to just focus on today. How do they tell B cells how to behave? Now this is a little bit like if you work in a job or you have a family, it's important to communicate. And if you communicate efficiently, the company, the family, the team, the whatever works well. Everyone's talking at the same time. No one's talking, you know, people are talking and others aren't listening ends up being really complicated and poor communication often leads to the failure of whatever you're trying to do. And that failure can be two ways. One is you don't do what you're supposed to do, or two, you do too much of what you shouldn't be doing. And we'll talk about that in a second. So again, I do not expect, unlike Dr. Anderson who said he was going to be a test, this is not going to be a test because trust me, this is really hard to remember and just when you think you have, it's changed. So. Um, <clears throat> But I think what is important to see here is lots of different types of cells. And all of these cells are actually, in your body, very coordinated, very organized, and highly efficient in communicating in a fashion that keeps all of them working well. The problem is that when they stop working well, all kinds of mayhem comes, uh, comes from that. And many of you with Waldenstrom's will understand that. So, how do these proteins talk? And I really just wanted to highlight a few ways in which they work, and then I'm going to give you some examples in real biology as to what they're actually doing. So there are many ways in which you can communicate with people, and the same thing is true for cells. So cell, some cells talk only to the cells that are kind of nearby. So it's a little bit of a whisper, if you like. So it's you sitting in the front row here chatting to the lady next door to you, and maybe the two or three around you will hear, but the folks in the back have no idea what you're talking about. Hence the microphone here, by the way, because if I just whispered like this, you wouldn't know what I was saying, right? <clears throat> so whispering is good, but it's only good for these folks here. But that's important because most of the time when you're whispering, you only want the folks around here to do because we're up to something and we're kind of making a plan, but we really don't know, want the person 
for whom this plan is, 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 is being set in place to know that that's going to happen. Same thing is true. Certain times when messages are given to cells close by, only those cells are supposed to do something, not cells that are far away. As I'll show you in a minute, you say that too loudly and everybody in the room starts to do that. Suddenly what you are planning to do is no longer efficient and problems arise. Second way in which cells talk to each other is that they actually need to make contact. So it's not just a whisper. This is a little bit like you're in the movies, you don't really care for this movie, you decide you're going to go, but you don't want to trouble other people, and you just nub, nudge the person with you and go, let's go. Just a little hand signal, if you like, or person's talking too loudly or too much, or your spouse has said the wrong thing, and it's a little kick under the table going, you shut up, please. <clears throat> But the cells need to talk to each other. And there are cells, what they, what they call receptors and ligands. So the ligand is the hand, the, the receptor is the leg or whatever, that little nudge, that little kick, that little bump. It has to be a touching for things to actually be, to be passed along. And the third way is that the cells actually sort of broadcast stuff widely. This is a little bit like putting out on Facebook that you hear at this meeting, you know, or Twitter to your hundreds and thousands of followers about what a fantastic time you just had and how much you learned. But the whole idea is these aren't people close by, these are people that aren't here, these are people that are at home but go, gosh, they're learning stuff at the Waldenstrom's Ed, Ed Forum. So again, cells do the same thing. They talk just to cells around them, they just do little touches to only certain cells, and or they broadcast more broadly kind of what they're up to. And all of that matters because that determines how cells behave. Now sometimes cells do things they shouldn't. So you can imagine this is one of those horrible bosses He's looking over your shoulder going, you need to just make that sale. And you go like, it's not even ethical, it's just do it. You know? And in some respects, sometimes cells get forced into doing something because they're getting a message that really isn't either for them or shouldn't be told as loudly to them and they misbehave, and many times in Waldenstrom's, that's what's happening. The cells are actually responding to somewhat normal messages given in an abnormal fashion. So the way in which, as I mentioned earlier, they talk to each other are proteins called cytokines. And cytokines are, there are hundreds and thousands of them, and they have all different messages. It's like language. So in other words, you know, we don't only have 10 things we say, we say hundreds and thousands of different things. And mixes of cytokines is like language. So again, when you'll see me highlighting a number of them now, don't be confused. It's really, we're just talking about and, but, the, and a few other words that are part of the language of cytokines, if you like. So this just shows you some of the work that we've been doing, where we take normal bone marrow, and we take Waldenstrom's bone marrow, and we take a whole bunch of patients, like your first selves, who have given us their bone marrow for research purposes, and we measure these proteins in the bone marrow and in the blood. And the question is just, we're trying to get a good understanding of the whispering that's going on in the bone marrow and the broadcasting like Twitter and, uh, and face, Facebook and others that's happening kind of more globally. And as you can tell, they are different in normal and patients with Waldenstrom's. Not going to highlight for you all of what this all means, except for you to hear that the messaging system is very different in Waldenstrom's compared to normal. Some of the work that we started off right in the beginning was with a protein called BLIS, otherwise called BAF. And what it is is called a B cell activating factor. Its job is to keep B cells alive. And you want to have that because otherwise your normal infection fighting cells would die off. But if you get too much of it, you start to make way more than the 1% you're supposed to have. So that's, if you like, miracle grow. For, for weeds, and it causes weeds to have a little bit of a selective advantage. And we went and looked and, at healthy people and people with Waldenstrom's. As you can see on the left, we looked at their blood, and it's higher in their blood than healthy controls. And then, not doesn't show, I'm sure, all that well, but you can see that kind of dark brown spotted stuff. You can see more of it in Waldenstrom's bone marrow than you can see in normal bone marrow, saying that this is, again, a protein that you're supposed to just have low levels of, and it's much higher when you have it in, have Waldenstrom's. And if you actually take that protein and you say, well, does it matter? And you put Waldenstrom cells in a culture with more of this bliss, you can see that green stuff is IgM. So not only does it help the cells grow, but it starts to actually encourage them to make more protein. 
So it's one of the ways in which your, your, your weeds kind of get a head start and an advantage over other cells. So where does it come from? Well, actually, interestingly, it comes from a number of places. It comes from the environment around. So you heard Dr. Anderson last night talking about double agents and people that are part, or cells that are kind of part of your normal environment but are actually facilitating and helping the cancer cells. Well, the same is true for this protein as it is for many other proteins. The microenvironment or the cells around the cancer cells get tricked into actually facilitating and helping the cancer cell growth. And interestingly, as the cells become more and more cancerous, they actually start to make their own. They kind of feed themselves, if you like. And so, again, one of those things, if you understand how this works, it's an opportunity to interfere with it and potentially improve outcome of patients. Now, as I mentioned, you don't just learn one language, one word. You don't just say, you know, banana, banana as your, your sole member of the way in which you might communicate. You need to know a lot of different words. And in some respects, these different cytokines all work together to make sentences, if you like. So here are two other proteins, IL-6 and IL-21. Both of them, again, cytokine proteins. They work along with bliss as ways to actually make the protein higher, the IgM higher, in Waldenstrom's. So again, you can see the black bar here is if you have really only, only culture and no addition of these other proteins. But in each case, you can see when you add the combinations back, the amount of IgM goes up. So these are kind of working together to facilitate IgM production. When we check to see, well, is IL-6, another protein that really helps B cells, is that high in uh, Waldenstrom's? You can see here at the top is one where a more normal bone marrow, and you can see there is some IL-6. You're supposed to have some of this. You're not supposed to have none, because if you have none, you'll have no B cells, and you need that 1%. But as you can tell a little further down, there's way more brown going on here, and this patient has high levels of IL-6, and because of that, much more in the way of production uh, of IgM. You can see this patient right down below looks a lot more similar to the first, to the control, to the normal patient. So it's not everybody has this going on. So again, just like some people are fluent in Italian and others are fluent in English and others are fluent in Mandarin or something, there are differences in how the commuter cells communicate uh, in Waldenstrom's. The other thing that's important is that if you again take IL-6 and you add it to cells and you look at how much IgM it makes, you can see very clearly this keeps going up. So again, like Bliss, like now IL-6, two different ways in which the cells are stimulated to produce more in the way of IgM. A third one I wanted to just mention that we've also done a lot of work around is uh, something called IL-21. So again, this is made by cells that are present in the tumor or present in the bone marrow, normal cells, mainly T cells and these natural killer cells. You've actually heard from Dr. Anderson last night that these cells, if in the right context and given the right message, and I think our next talk is gonna talk about that, they could actually kill the cancer cell. So that would be good. But they are being fooled here into make some, making something that actually promotes the plasma cell. And uh, that's what you're seeing here. You're seeing, again, more brown stuff. That's the staining that we use for the IL-21. And if you look here to see whether we, you have the receptors present, you can see all of the cells kind of have that nudge, that touch that they need, the, the, the way in which they would actually connect with each other. That's present on all of these cells. And similarly, if you go ahead and actually treat the cells, two things happen. Not only does it make uh, the uh, IL-10 and IL-6, which are two other cytokines, go up, it also promotes the growth of the cells. But what you're seeing here with all these stripes is us looking at ways in which we can tell if the cell is more of a lymphocyte or more of a plasma cell, and it actually promotes the cell changing its nature from that inactive lymphocyte into the highly active plasma cell, and that's another way in which IL-21 makes these cells more proficient in making uh, IgM. Now here's what's interesting, is that sometimes, again, it's sort of like that knock-on effect, the domino effect, where cells are talking to cells, you pass the message on to a third party before the message comes back. And here is a protein called CCL5, called Rantes, which actually controls the production of IL-6. So this one doesn't do anything directly to the cancer. It's like the boss, if you like, who's just telling others to do the bad work. 
And so what I really wanted to highlight here is the fact that there are networks, if you like, of communication that's going on, all of which results in more cells growing and more protein being produced. So I wanted to kind of finish off a little bit by the fact that, talk about the fact that um, many times the communication happens at a normal level, but as I've joked in the past, sometimes it gets really loud and the cells are actually talking to each other in kind of like, would you tone it down kind of terms. And why would that matter? Well, just like me yelling into the microphone got everybody a little on edge going, would he shut up? That's really annoying. You can imagine that goes on and on and on and on and on. The cell's like, I'll do it. Just stop yelling at me. I promise I'll do it. And in some respects, that's what happens. So you go, okay, well, tell me how on earth that's biologically relevant. Well, you all heard of and you're going to hear a lot more about MYD or MYD88 mutations. So how does that work? Remember I told you this is part of the toll-like receptor pathway. This is the way in which normally the immune system would react. Well, right here in the green, you can see is where this protein lies, right downstream of this TLR, toll-like receptor. And it, when it is mutated, it is a gain of function mutation, which basically means you've amped it up. So it's got loud. So now the message that the body or the cells are getting is there is a crisis here. Do something really fast. Do it now and do lots of it. And it yells all the time. So what do these cells do? They make lots of IgM. That's what they're programmed to do. And the louder the message, the more they make. So the mutation, there are other things that it probably does too, but one of the things that it does is it drives the way in which the cell works. So what you can see is it causes the cell to be much more likely to stay alive longer, and it then causes it to crank back up itself, all of these cytokines. So suddenly everybody in the bone marrow started talking all at the same time, and everyone's yelling really loudly, and it sounds like a market. And instead of everyone being controlled and talking in turn and sharing the information, it's just hubbub and yelling and talking and screaming, and everyone's trying to do something. And at the end of the day, it's inefficient, but it's actually bad. And the weeds grow, and the control and the hoeing and all the other things that are supposed to be happen, happening are not. So, again, just too important to know that this is a highly regulated system, usually. Usually there's not this yelling. Usually it's a very orderly. The guy up at the platform is banging the gavel going, no, it's his turn, it's her turn, you sit down. Um, but in the, in the whole situation in Waldenstrom's, this has become, as you heard from Maury, dysregulated, out of control. And depending on how dysregulated, it drives how more rapidly or less rapidly the disease may progress. So I just wanted to highlight the fact that we heard a little bit about this yesterday. The fact that PDL1 and PDL2, these are the camouflage, if you like, that cells have on them. So there are many ways in which the cells are interacting with each other. The bad cells are being told to be left telling the immune system to leave them, to leave them alone. There are other cells telling the cancer cells to grow. There are other proteins telling the cancer cells to make IgM. So as you can imagine, this is a bizarre. This is kind of loud and noisy and somewhat out of control. As we understand how to control this better, or as we bring in some of the weed killer and start just kind of leveling the fields here and getting rid of these cells, that's what brings things back under better control. So what I hope that you heard as we chatted a little bit about how cells work and how they talk to each other, well, Waldenstrom's, as you know, has got two problems. The predominant one is this lymphoplasmacytic cell, the weeds that are growing in the bone marrow. The problem downstream is that it makes this protein, and the protein is a normal protein usually, but now it's become a monoclonal protein targeting only one thing, and it's actually ended up being at way higher levels. It's a big molecule. It gets stuck in the circulation. It sticks to things, and it causes problems. Second thing I hope that you heard is that there is this network, this language, if you like, of proteins made by, this, by the, the system in general, actually normal proteins, but all now being generated at super high levels. And when they are being generated at super high levels, the communication gets confused and the cells get told to do things they really shouldn't be doing. And finally, what I heard you hear is that sometimes the communication is super loud. So this mutation in Mighty 88 results in amplification, amping up, making loud the whole communication system. 
and the cells almost are going, stop yelling at me, I promise to do it. And so they are making a lot of cells, a lot of protein, really in a, a way that they should not be. So with that, I'd like to just thank some of the folks that work in my lab, and I'd like to thank very much the Waldenstrom's Foundation for your uh, support of our research, and thank you for listening.